Welcome in, everyone, to another edition of Let's Talk Utes. Today, we are going to be uh, talking about the SUU game. Finally, we have football back. We're going to be previewing Baylor. We're going to be giving out our locks of the week, and we are going to go through our weekly Big 12 power rating. Before we start, just wanted to thank you guys for 100 subscribers. We really appreciate that. And if you haven't subscribed, please click the subscribe button. That really helps us. Also, uh, no Connor today. He was busy, so we'll catch up with him on a later episode. Okay, let's jump right into the SUU preview. It felt so good to have football back mm -hmm. in Utah, obviously dominant 49 to zero. Landon, what's your initial takeaway from this game? My initial takeaway is that Utah just absolutely took care of business. Utah had a little bit more questions or a few more questions than some teams would have playing against an FCS team because we have Cam coming back. He's been injured for so long. How is he going to look? We have Keithy coming back also off injury. But they honestly just came in in the first half and just they're back to who they were. They both played so well. Like You can see it right there on the stats. Five touchdowns for Cam, and he didn't even play the entire first half. I just saw a Utah team that is back, is firing on all cylinders, and that's honestly all that I took away from it. Probably my biggest takeaway is in the running back room. Michael Bernard and Dijon Stanley looked incredible. And Jalen Glover and Mike Mitchell, they both look great. But just comparison, Dijon Stanley is probably the biggest weapon Utah has this off this season. His speed is unmatched. As you can see, like six carries for 34 yards. That's okay. That's not super impressive. But the three receptions, 150 yards, two touchdowns. Mm -hmm. Both of those touchdowns comes on come off insane will routes that I do not see a linebacker in the country being able to guard that guard him out of the backfield. They'll have to bring in a safety, which will open up so much more for Utah, for the wide receivers, for the elite tight end room we have. And then obviously Michael Bernard, we talked about him a little bit last week where he, he looked bigger, he looked, mm -hmm. but he also kept that speed. And I think he'll be able to get a lot of those one reps. That was probably one of my biggest takeaways, just how good the running back room did look, because that was probably one of our biggest question marks all for the whole season. Yeah, I know for me, certainly, I was a lot more juice for this game than I am for the typical FCS game, like Landon mentioned. I think that the return of Rising after 606 days away from call action, the return of Keithy after you know an even longer absence really made this must-watch TV. Rising, obviously, I think is the headliner takeaway for me. You know, just seeing five touchdowns by a quarterback's name for Utah football, just that seems surreal. Yeah. That doesn't even seem real. Like, I kind of still can't believe it on, almost. Um, usually, at least a couple of those TDs are kind of, you know, siphoned away by the running game that Kyle Winningham loves to implement. And yeah, like I said, um, Dijon Stanley, new weapon on, this, on the scene. As we can see here, six carries, three receptions. Getting him nine touches, I think that that really is the baseline for what Utah needs to be yeah. going forward because he's so dynamic. Yeah, I absolutely love Dijon Stanley as well. Getting into the defense a little bit, I mean, I feel like the defense was exactly as advertised. If you look at the stats here, you can see SUU 3 of 13 on third down, 0 of 1 on fourth down, averaging only 3.4 yards per pass and 2.6 yards per rush. So basically just... They weren't able to do anything, which is exactly what we expected. Van Fillinger looked improved from last year. He actually looked really nice, and I'm glad that he was able to heal up from that injury. Logan Fano also looked nice as well. It didn't seem like he was hindered or slowed whatsoever. And then obviously, Tanavasa and Junior Tafuna, interior defensive linemen, just looked like absolute monsters, especially Tanavasa. It seems like he has even grown and developed from last year, which is crazy considering he's already... 6'4", over 300 pounds. So I am just was, so excited to see what this defense is going to be this year. A ton of boss is a, is a man-child, bro. Mm -hmm. being, a, being a true sophomore and coming in and looking like that is insane. Again, a lot of this, we got to take this with a grain of salt a little bit. We're playing against SUU. They're not good. They did not look at it at all. Their offense looked anemic. But just from what we saw, the defense looked incredible. The... Secondary did take a big hit with the loss of Keenan Johnson. He, 
starting cornerback for Utah, the Georgia Tech transfer. Seems like he's out for season. Um, Witt, I don't think Witt has said anything specifically, but just through the injury wise, it did look pretty rough. Has anybody seen heard anything about his injury being? Yeah, I don't. Season? I don't think Whittingham typically will tell about injury data, but it didn't look good. I mean, it's never good when it's a non-contact injury. He's writhing on the ground in pain. You know, he comes out of the tent in crutches. I'm, I would be pretty certain it's either, you know, something in the knee, like an ACL or the Achilles in the calf. Um, I think it's probably one of those. And I would, mm-hmm. I think he's probably done for the season. Yeah. yeah. I'm in the exact and, same boat with you. I think it's probably season ending. Yeah. Um, there is another injury. Um, the Mahi also on the defensive line got injured. That is, I would say not as big of a loss as Keenan Johnson, not because of, you know, their talent level or how good they are just because the defensive tackle room has more bodies there that I think can play at a top tier level. Yeah, I completely agree. But Mahi, he looked really good too. I mean, it's the defensive tackles in general, the size they have, which is impressive. Um, yeah. Losing Kim is going to suck, but I think we have guys, next man up mentality. Utah's defense always has it. I think we'll be okay on that front. The Keenan Johnson injury is where I'm a little concerned just because so much, we have such youth at the quarterback yeah. position mm-hmm. behind him. I do think there are a few areas that Coach Whittingham is definitely going to get cleaned up. Six penalties for 55 yards while, you know, not a huge total. That's always something that Whittingham stresses is, you know, play clean, no penalties, no procedural penalties. We had a couple of false starts, you know, a couple of other penalties that I think Witt will want to clean up. Yeah, the only downside of this game, I would say, is probably the O-line play was a little bit lacking of where we would hope it is. But I still have faith that the line can clean it up. It's a young unit, and I think they just need a little bit more time to mesh. I definitely do as well. You know, a few missed assignments. I think that there was a little bit of pressure. Um, Cam is so good at avoiding pressure that we only took, I think, one sack. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was Isaac Wilson. But yeah, I think the O-line has a few things to clean up. That is an area of improvement, I think. I do think having Cameron Rising as the quarterback helps them tremendously, especially when it comes to the offensive line with the pressure. Like you said, he's so good in the pocket and, and setting that pressure. I think that will help them tremendously. And having that quarterback, they know that he's your one quarterback. He's taking all the reps in practice. Mm-hmm. Everyone behind, in front of him is taking the same, so same reps. I think they did look a lot worse under Isaac Wilson. Kind of talking about him, like if you look on the on the screen, two interceptions thrown that was from Isaac Wilson. For me, one of those was a pretty big, pretty big miss from him, and the other one was third down and long, got pressure and threw it, tried to do a little bit too much. Um, kind of talking about Isaac Wilson. What are your guys' thoughts on him? I thought he did okay given the circumstance. I liked that the coaches threw him in at the end of the second half in that like 25, 30 second scenario. Just get a little pressure on him, see what he can do. And then he just has the growing pains of any true freshman. I mean, he graduated high school early. He honestly should still be a senior right now. He's so young, and I think just getting game reps is vital. And he started honestly looking better towards the end of the game. Mm hmm. I do think there were bright spots for sure, you know, where he delivered, you know, on time, on target balls to the right guy that was open. You know, it was a bit of a mixed bag, which is what you expect from a true freshman that got the QB2 nod. I thought there was a lot to take away that was good. And then there was a lot that was also bad. You know, he shouldn't be throwing into triple coverage in the end zone. That's going to get picked off every single time. Yes. He should have just taken, you know, loner underneath on the crossing route on the drag to be able to, you know, Mm -hmm. get the easy first down on third down, but he got a little greedy, you know, maybe that flies in high school, but you know, this is, you know, even though SUU is an FCS team, like we have to remember, that's still the best competition Isaac Wilson has ever played in his career. And so it's a little bit of a step up. It's a little bit of a learning period. I mean, speaking of Caleb Loiner, he doesn't look like a freaking man man against boys on that team, man. (laughs) He's so big. That catch in the end zone from Isaac Wilson was awesome. I'd love to see more of that this season. He's just going to be a red zone weapon that Utah can utilize. No, there's not a corner in the country that can guard a six foot eight basketball player that has probably have a 35, 40 inch vertical. 
Yeah, another thing, I was impressed with Loner's ability to block as well. They weren't just only putting him in for passing plays. He was actually doing a great job blocking. Yeah, in that the... honestly stunned me. Like, I was expecting him to be, like, very, very super player. You know, the coaches would only put in, you know, for a certain package or red zone maybe. But they were, like, straight up putting him in yeah. to block. And, I mean, he's huge. So, like, clearly he's got, like, the size and strength to do it. But it was just shocking for someone with no football experience to me. Dude, when Utah came out with that jumbo package on that either third and short or fourth and short, that just looked so ridiculous. <laughs> Having that jumbo package with three tight ends in. And, like, Loner was one of them. The size was just outrageous. I feel like he just sticks out like a sore thumb on a football field because he's just so much bigger than everyone <laughs> yeah. else. You know, not in a bad way, in a good way. You know, pops off the screen kind of. Mm -hmm. well, there's pictures of him next to every other tight end, and he he's a freak. <laughs> it's crazy. I love it, dude. I, that 14 personnel that we brought out, I'm a huge fan. I thought it looked so ridiculous that I, mm -hmm. I just cannot like help, help us smile thinking about it dude. Yeah. it was so well, cool you even see him line up like in that 14 personnel next to keithy he's made keithy's like six two six three and he's making him look like the freaking punt returner <laughs> yeah like, it's crazy. he looks tiny yeah like when they were celebrating in the end zone after yes. one of the keithy tds was it was, was like is this How, like the size speed size. slot wide receiver keithy like is like <laughs> you know it's like he looks so small yeah Outside of like the offensive line play and obviously a little bit of concerning concerns about Isaac Wilson, what, what's what's your guys' biggest concern from this week from for Utah football? I wouldn't say that there's really a lot of concerns anywhere else. You know, I would say that the other concern is clearly, you know, the injuries. Utah can't have too many of those pile up, especially at positions like cornerback. So I would say that is the biggest for me because this is honestly a really complete team. I thought every position group had really bright moments. I would say for me that I would be the most worried about offensive line. It's by no means unfixable, but an offensive line can kind of hinder the potential of a unit. And so I just feel like if there's one position group that needs to be brought up a little bit, it's probably the offensive line. Definitely. I totally agree. For me, I do think it's fixable. For me, it's it's pretty niche, but like Cam Rising taking kits, freaking slide. That's all I got to say. Like, I might have a hot take on this, but I don't mind it. I don't really care. I don't know, man. We need him, dude. If he gets hurt one more one more time, we're screwed. I, I truly believe that. He's, after seeing Isaac Wilson, Isaac Wilson's going to be good, but Isaac, he, he left a little bit to desired. So I think keeping Cam is, is a key, key thing for us this year. Yeah, I think the... I don't know. If you've listened to any interviews with him, he's not going to stop running. That's just like a fact. Like he's not going to. I do think he's getting smarter with it, and I think he's doing as well as he can. But dude, he's a big physical guy. Like he's going to keep running, and I think that's a part of his game that we shouldn't be so quick to completely lock off. Yeah, I'm kind of in the middle of both of you guys, you know, where I'm like a few of the ones I'm like the extra yard was well, not worth it against you know? SUU specifically. He does need to choose his spots a little bit better. Like just throw it out of bounds. Yeah. And like he wasn't really sliding. He was like kind of diving, mm -hmm. which like you can mm -hmm. still hit them when they're diving. So like yeah, I prefer it's him not to the turn same as giving yourself up. If you like, dive. But not, that's yeah, not giving exactly. yourself up. You can be hit. But not everyone can slide. I don't know if you guys remember think... trying to watch Tyler oh Huntley slide. Oh my gosh, bro. Dude could not He was slide. injuring dude himself trying slide. to slide. It was insane. <laughs> it was like, did you just break your knee sliding? Yeah. It's like, obviously, Cam really hasn't slid before in his career very often. Yeah. And so he's not used to it. He's diving forward. It's just his natural instinct. But, you know, I think they need to drill him a little bit on the slide. Because if you're giving yourself up, then you can't be hit. But, you know, a linebacker could come in and drill him if yeah. you just, like, dives forward which is what i'm worried about well i just like remember that i think it's like second and five and he decides to he steps up in the pocket and goes through the hole that he had i'm like dude just throw the ball away it doesn't matter it's we'll be third and five against fcu we'll be okay it's like yeah know, especially on, when we were up 28 to zero i was like don't run bro it's like it doesn't I, matter. Have, I have so much respect for him being such a gamer though like, he I does do not care. Like, he literally just, in all of his interviews, he's like, if it's the best play for the team to win, I'm running. I respect like, that. Like, you know what? I respect I, that, dude. Like, he's trying to be more careful, but he's going to do what he's got to do. Yeah. 
That's one thing true. that I thought was really encouraging was that this was an extremely vanilla playbook from Utah. Mm-hmm. Like they literally ran the same play like a couple different times, especially, you know, the Dijon Stanley yeah. route. But I feel like it's good to put some of that stuff on tape because then you can set up other plays based mm-hmm. off of that. You know, I guarantee you against Baylor, we're going to run Dijon Stanley out. They're going to think it's a wheel route and we're going to hit singer of a post on the opposite side. Exactly. You know, and like it's going to, they're not going to be expecting it. Their safety is going to come down to try to stop Dijon Stanley and then we're going to hit singer over the top. Yeah. Something like that is going to happen. Well, that's what I'm hoping for. I mean, especially if they, if they have to put a safety on Stanley. There's no, like I said earlier, there's no middle linebacker yeah. in the country that can keep up with him in that, with that wheel route. I will and say so, something that stood out to me so much. When's the last time that Utah, like, it's felt that easy? One of my things always with the passing game, it always felt so hard with Utah. Like, we had no explosive plays. No one was ever open. It didn't feel like our scheme was really setting our guys up for success. It was so laughably easy against SUU. Like, 20 yards open every touchdown which is just insane to me yeah and i think people will say oh it's suu of course it's gonna be easy but i think something we've seen this week especially in the it's not always easy no like some of these teams have struggled to score and like put points on the board Mm -hmm. and i think the fact that utah didn't even after such long absences from rising and keithy that's impressive yeah well i'm just saying like even a team like oregon struggled to score against idaho like just because your team is good does not instantly mean that your offense is going to work easily. Like you've still got legit players on the other side of the ball playing against you. I think this is a year where Utah's offense is going to be very good. And the defense has just got to keep up. If they can be as good as they have been in the past, it's going to be a special year. Yeah, I totally agree. Anything else on SUU that you guys have? Everything for me. So, Okay. Let's move on to the Baylor preview. So Baylor was also playing an FCS team this week. Tarleton State got him at home. They won 45 to 3. Um, I'll ramble through a couple of these stats here really quick, and then we can talk about it. Their new transfer quarterback from uh, Toledo, uh, Daquan Finn, 14 of 22, 192 yards, two touchdowns, two interceptions. Uh, leading rusher, Rushing yards leader with 18 carries was R. Reese for 78 yards. Receiving yards was Jackson Jr., two receptions, 69 yards, one touchdown. Um, Obviously, Tarleton State really was not able to get very much going. Only nine first downs and 181 total yards. That's a pretty good performance Mm -hmm. from the Baylor defense and from the Baylor offense. What sticks out to you guys here about Baylor's first game? I think that the biggest X factor has got to be a quarterback. New quarterback this year for Baylor, Dequan Finn. I thought he looked pretty good. I liked his ability to scramble and run, but he also kind of fits the classic archetype of like good runner, dual threat, but he's a little loose with accuracy and reading the field. That was one of my my main takeaways, but he does have very big arm, very nice athletic player. So I think he'll be pretty good for them. Probably my biggest takeaway for Baylor this from last game was just the difference they had in their trenches from this year to last year, at least from the Utah game from last year. They didn't. They looked a lot bigger. They looked a lot more physical. Again, it's Tarleton State, so that's another thing we got to consider. But, I mean, last year they had Texas, Texas State at home, and they lost because they just were out physical. And so I think an improvement on that end for them is something that is is nice to see. I think Finn, he looked really good. He had some moments where it's like, is he passing is a little concerning on some of those moments, but he was an excellent runner. And I really liked um Ashton Hawkins. He he was he the transfer from Texas State, talking about them earlier actually. Um he had, he had a few moments there where he he looked really good. He had that one I think it was the f- first touchdown pass for Finn where he kind of just dogged the um, Tarleton State secondary and took it in for a touchdown, which was impressive. Yeah, talking a little bit more about Daquan Finn, I'm, I'm very similar to these guys. I think he looked... I don't think like he's an elite quarterback by any means, but I definitely think he's serviceable and like a, like a Power 5 starter level for sure. 
Um, I thought he was pretty good at like hitting the open guy. Like when receivers were open, like he typically found them at a decently high clip and like delivered a pretty good ball to them. I also think his running ability was also a game changer for Baylor. He's not a very big quarterback, so they don't run him like a ton. They're not, it's not like an Anthony Richardson situation where he's going to run like 15 to 20 times a game. He's going to pick his spots, but he's got elusiveness. He's got speed. And he can, you know, he obviously had a really long touchdown run in this one that was a really, really nice play, I thought. So he's a dual threat quarterback. Um, Like Landon said, he gets a little loose with it. There was a couple of times that he threw into double or even triple coverage. Um, Just bad decision making. And I think that he probably had even a couple more that could have been picked. So two picks was probably uh, pretty good for him. But he also had a couple more that could have been, you know, touchdowns. You know, Baylor's not going to be putting the foot on the throttle against Tarleton State the whole mm-hmm. entire game. You know, they're not going to be trying to throw deep every single play. Um, so, yeah, all in all, I think he's a good quarterback. I think that he is someone that, you know, you want to contain in the pocket and you want to force him to be a passer. You want to take away his first read and you want to make, you know, you want to like bait him into mistakes, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to bait him into throwing into double coverage, things like that. Mm-hmm. For yeah. me, like a big thing I also I saw from them is slightly improved defense. I mean, if we're looking at like the big six previews, I, their defensive overall for the adjusted per play was ranked 69th out of 70 in power for power four teams. And they're returning 82% of production. And that can either be a good thing or a bad thing. And I think for the most for the most part for us, that tends to be a bad thing when the defense is, is quite bad. They looked okay against Tarleton State. Like, nothing that really, like, wow, they looked incredible. I mean, they did they did their job. They held them to three points. I think, obviously, next week against Utah is their real test. Um, so, but that's something that was interesting. They just, they did look, a, they did look improved on that side of the ball, though. Yeah, I mean, my main takeaway as well was just taking care of business against a team like this, which is something they didn't do last year. And that's my main takeaway. Yeah, there's not a ton you can learn from the typical FCS game, I would say. Um, One thing that did impress me was their defensive line. I thought their defensive line got after it. They looked aggressive. They looked nasty. They looked athletic. I thought they were improved from last year. Uh, You know, as you can see, 41 rushing attempts and only allowing 2.5 yards per rush. To me, that's a pretty freaking good performance. Um, Yeah, that's something that I think you can be proud of against really most opponents. I also think that the offensive line maybe was slightly leaky. It seemed like Tarleton State was getting a little bit more pressure than I think would have been typical for a normal FCS game. So I think that's an area that Utah could potentially have an advantage with their deep, veteran, mm-hmm. talented veteran defensive line. Yeah, I agree completely. Okay, um, let's move on to the next keys to the game. So for Utah, the keys to the game are containing the QB run game. You know, as we know, Daquan Finn is, you know, quite a dynamic athlete. Protect the quarterback and, you know, run a balanced offense. Uh, what, what of those three points sticks out to you, Landon? Yeah, so the main thing that sticks out to me is contain the QB run game. I think that the Utah defense is going to have a good showing, but the one thing that could make this dicey is if we let the QB break that contain. If you remember the Florida game a few years ago, Anthony Richardson really was not passing on Utah. They weren't really running the ball effectively on Utah. It was the QB runs that absolutely killed that game for Utah. The defense would hold up great in coverage. They're great in like traditional run sets. But then Anthony Richardson would just break a run that it's like, oh my gosh, and they would just score from that. And so I think Utah, with their defense being so good overall, if they can avoid Daquan Finn being able to scramble for those first downs, I think they're going to have a very dominant showing. I think something like a leaky Gilman being having a spy if if, if that continues to to hurt Utah throughout the throughout the game will be very very helpful. They did that a little bit against SUU. Um, SUU they have a, like a two quarterback set for one of them was more of a passing quarterback, one of them was more of a running quarterback. In the first quarter, the running quarterback was in the game more often, and it did it was a little sketchy for Utah. I mean, they held them to zero, obviously, and they did clean up from that first quarter 
But the first quarter, I mean, they were, the quarterback was able to scramble and, and create some pressure for Utah that probably wasn't expected. So you think that's a good little practice for this game. Um, I think for me, uh, probably the big key for, is protecting Cam Rising. He's the key to the season. He's the key to this game. If he gets hurt or if he gets hit over and over and over again, like Tanner said, for this much improved defensive line from Baylor, that could be a problem, and that could really hurt and hinder Utah's chances in this game. Yeah, for me, the balanced offense is really what they've set up a lot that I think could help with that. Um, versus SUU, there was three touchdowns to Brant Keithy, who's a tight end, and two touchdowns to Dijon Stanley, who's a running back. I would like to see the receivers get more involved because I think that makes Utah much, much harder to stop because you're going to have to defend all over the field. There's not someone that you can, you know, help off of. There's not some place you're looking to like find where Utah's going to go with it. So I think balanced offense, getting the receivers more involved than they were in the first game um, is a big key for me. Yeah, I completely agree with you. If Utah's offense is multifaceted and has a bunch of different dimensions, I just don't think Baylor has the personnel to stop what Utah is going to be looking to do on offense. Okay, let's move on to talk about the keys to the game for a Baylor Bears victory. I think limiting turnovers, creating explosive plays, and pressuring the QB are three ways that you know would allow them to pull the huge road upset. What do you guys think about those three points? Yeah, I can start off on this one. Pressure the QB was a huge key for Baylor, in my opinion. You actually saw what happened with the last year that they played. With Bryson Barnes in there, the offensive line wasn't doing very well in pass protection, and it actually caused him to turn the ball over. Utah couldn't move the ball. And if you're able to pressure the QB and make Utah one-dimensional where they're not able to throw downfield, that's just going to go a long ways in containing the overall offense. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Obviously, it's a big key for Utah protecting the quarterback. So if they can get to Cam, to Cam I'll be that'd be good for them. A big thing um, for for Baylor as well is just create creating explosive plays. The biggest thing for them is to expose the young def- uh, Utah safeties and secondary. I mean, obviously, we talked about Ke- Keenan Johnson getting hurt. Um. That's going to hurt Utah. So can whoever's coming in that corner, can they step up and help out? And can Baylor expose that? That's the big thing for them this for this game. Yeah, I definitely think the explosive plays are critical because no one really goes into Utah, especially Rice Cycle Stadium, and is able to you know ball control the game away mm-hmm. versus Utah. That just simply just doesn't happen very often. All of the losses Utah's taken over pretty much the last decade which is not very many losses at home, have been because the team has been able to expose weak spots and they've been able to create a lot of chunk plays and you know get the offense moving really well in a way that you know tired the defense out and t- really tested out you know the conditioning of everyone. So I think with a game where like the spread is you know between 15 and 17 points at most sports book you'd go into, there is an element of you know, luck or like swing plays that I think Baylor needs to tap into. So that's why I think it's more critical for Baylor to create explosive plays, get Utah on the back foot than it is for maybe Utah to do the same to Baylor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else about keys to the game or leave it there? That's good for me. Okay. Let's move on to the prediction section of the game. So Landon, tell us why you picked 42 to six as your game prediction. So this is a prediction. If I had to rate like a confidence level, I don't feel super confident about it just because we've only had one game so far this season. I do think that Utah is going to win big this game, though, just because of how many veterans are coming back. Some teams take a few weeks to kind of gel and mesh and get together. So many of these guys on Utah have been playing for so many years already, though. So I think they'll be ready to play. I also think at home, they're going to want to make a statement. They're going to want to win big. And I just think Utah's offense is going to be way too explosive for Baylor. I think that this offense has a good chance of being the best that Utah has ever had. And I just don't think Baylor's going to be able to match up with that. I also think that we know how it goes in Rice Echoes when you have a QB who's not quite as experienced, is a little turnover prone. 
I think it's going to be very hard for them to sustain consistent offense. And so I think Utah is going to score a decent amount in the first half, probably score around like 30, 30 something in the first half, and then kind of just run the clock out after that. Baylor might only get three possessions in the second half. For me, I have Utah winning 35-10. Pretty similar points to Landon, just one key addition. So I think this game is going to be a little bit less like a, of a scoring. I wouldn't be surprised if it's like a 28 to 7 type of situation. I do think Utah um, wins by a good margin, 20 plus points. Um, I, the reason why I think it's going to be a, could be a lower slowing, ga- a lower scoring game is just I see Baylor really running the clock down with uh, long drives with a lot of runs, um, kind of like how SEU did last week. I think it kind of showed that like maybe trying to again expose that youth that Utah does have on some parts of the defense. Um, but Rice Eccles is just too much of a fortress for any team to come in, let alone a team that doesn't have the experience like Baylor, doesn't have the the it factor that a Baylor team, the other teams do have coming into Rice Eccles. It's hard to win, and I don't think they get it done this week. I do think that Utah will win a comfortable margin. I picked 38-17 to 17 for the game. I am giving the Baylor offense some pretty good respect here. 17 points is, it's tough to score on Utah at home. I think that there is enough moving pieces on the Utah defense as far as, you know, the injury to Kenan Johnson and Aliki of the Mahi, um, the loss of Cole Bishop and Sione Vaki from this, uh, the safety room last year, that I think there will be a few kind of chinks in the armor that maybe Baylor gets a few plays um, against, a few chunk plays on. So I'm giving them 17 points. I think that that would be a pretty good offensive performance from them. And I think something that, you know, I think is would be pretty expected. As far as Utah, 38 points seems kind of right in the sweet spot to me. I think that Utah is going to have multiple sustained drives. They're going to try to, you know, control the clock, control the ball, really dictate the game on their terms. And I think that they're going to be able to do it. I think that with an offense this varied and with this many weapons, 38 points is going to be a good result for them. Yeah, um, for where me, do you, oh, you go. Say, where do you think those points come from um, on the Utah side for both I think, you guys? I think probably two rushing, three passing. For me, I see, I see a lot of passing touchdowns here. I think that we're honestly, just because we have so many weapons, we're going to really air it out this game. I think there could be a lot of big explosive passing plays. I, I do think that this is a game to air it out because I think their secondary is a lot weaker than their defensive Agreed. line, just judging that based off the Tarleton State game. So I think, you know, getting their linebackers in space with our tight ends and our running backs and, you know, trying to take advantage of their corners with our receivers is probably the best game plan for consistent offense but Mm -hmm. you know it's winning him he's never gonna not run the ball at all i just i think back to the last year where we played baylor even when nate johnson came in with the passing ability he had it was gashing their defense i just can't imagine what it's gonna look like with cam out there with singer keithy parks Pittman, even more weapons i just think it's gonna be a lot of scoring on big plays for me, I have Cam scoring four touchdowns, three of those in the air, one in, on the mm, ground. The running TD. And then I have like a Mike Mitchell or a Bernard touchdown in the red zone, just a short short yardage situation where you get a big hole from the, the line and go in there. Um, I do think we're going to, hopefully, this is a hope, we do utilize the wide receivers a little bit more this game, um, especially that guy, Dorian Singer. Our dog. Yeah, I totally um, agree. I hope that's it. Hope the case, and I do think Utah is going to do that. And I think um, we'll, we'll see at least a few touchdowns from wide receivers. I do respect Baylor a lot. I think that this team is better than last year's team in mm-hmm. most phases. I would say maybe the offensive line is a little worse, but I think that in most phases, I think this Baylor team is better than the last one. I think that they're you know a pretty solid team. But pretty solid teams don't really go into Rice Eccles and win games. It just doesn't really happen if you're a pretty solid team. You have to be pretty much an elite team. Um, To kind of go back on that, like the last two teams to win were Pac-12 champion in Washington in, I think, five years ago. 
or more than that. And then well, I think the last two were Oregon last year and USC in 2020. Oh, I guess yeah, 2020. I wasn't thinking about 2020, but yes. But yeah, yeah. great teams. <laughs> yeah, I don't think many Baylor fans are really expecting you know, win. I think that if they, you know, I think 38 to 17 would be a good result. Like, I think that that is like a respectable performance where like, I would believe that they Mm -hmm. had, you know, some hope of like a pretty good big 12 season. Yeah. The reason that I see less than 17 that I only gave them two field goals for six is I just don't think they'll be able to run at all on Utah's defensive line and that linebacker duo. They weren't really even able to move the ball last year. And our defense in that area is even better, D-line and linebacker. And so they're going to have to pass. And I just don't think that Daquan Finn is a good enough passer that he's really going to be able to expose the secondary. I just see them struggling to move the ball in general. Do you guys know if it's a day or night game? I can't remember. It's a day game. It's at 1.30 p.m. Okay. So, yeah, it's. A, I think, yeah, I agree on all your points. <laughs> Especially the idea of where it's running the ball landed. That's yeah, exactly my thought process as well. Yeah, I mean, we held Florida to 13 rushing yards last year in the season opener with, I think they have a better O-line than this Baylor team and a better running back as well. I mean, Trevor Etienne, the starter for Georgia now, and then Montrell Johnson, proven <clears throat> very good running back, starter for Florida still. Mm-hmm. And I also think one thing to think about as well is that Baylor will probably be playing from behind, so they're not going to want to slow down the game. And so I could see a lot of drives that go three and out very quickly, which is why I'm only giving them six. It's a very good point. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Let's move on to our locks of the week. First, we're going to preview our locks of the week for the SUU game. Um, Landon unfortunately missed his. Isaac Brutal. was over 1.5 TDs. But me, Ethan, and Connor... <clears throat> We all uh, successfully got our locks correct. Tanner with the lock of the week, lock of the week times three with Cam Keithy getting yeah. three touchdowns. Yeah, I week. mean, I, I was pretty excited about that. <laughs> we rated that a one, a one out of ten difficulty when you yeah. revealed that was your lock, and we were definitely right about that. Yeah, you just knew it was going to happen. For like sure. Ludwig was scheming that up for sure. Like I there mean, was no chance we were leaving that out. If you remember there. Keithy, the last time he was healthy. He was just being, he's Rising's favorite target, and it feels like we have a whole separate playbook designed just to get him the ball. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, let's move on to our locks for this week, the Baylor game. Landon, do you want to explain your lock? Yeah, so for me, I'm doing one that's focused on the defense. I'm doing Baylor is going to score two touchdowns or less or under 14.5 points. I've already gotten into this a little bit with the previous slide, but I just think matchup-wise... This is a great matchup for Utah. Our strength of the defense, defensive line, is their very weakest offensive line. And when a team can't block, they can't pass block, they can't run, it just goes downhill extremely quickly for the offense. Like, even if you have some really talented players, it just, it becomes almost impossible to do anything. So I just, I see Baylor scoring 14 points or less. I rate that probably like a, a four out of ten. I think it's it's mm-hmm. it's a likely scenario. I do think there is that situation where Baylor can run on us, which is would be concerning. Kind of like Tanner talked about in, in the last slide, giving him giving them seventeen points. Um, so a four out of ten for me. I'll, I'll rate that as six because I think that you know with a point total so low, fourteen point five, like all they really need is one lucky play and then one like good TD drive and then like a field goal. Like it's like not too much of a thing to get to. Mm -hmm. So for me, I do think that there is some bus potential just with, you know, how football is played in general. So I'll give that a six. My lock this week is Cam rising under eight and a half incompletions. Um, Just watching Cam last week, the rust is off. He's going to be throwing the ball. And I think our wide receivers, tight ends, running backs, they're going to get open this um, this this week. Like Tanner brought up a little bit on the last slide, again, Baylor's secondary is probably their weakest bunch on the defense. I feel like Cam Rising is going to expose that and pass the ball to maybe even a little bit more covered guys than they did last week. Yeah, that's pretty bold in my opinion. I would probably give that like an 8 out of 10. 8.5 or... Like, nine incompletions is not that many. 
even if you think to SUU, he didn't even play a full half of the game and he had five incompletions. And I think we're going to pass more. He only had 15 attempts. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see him in the 30s or maybe even 40s or 50s. So that's that's pretty bold. I could see it and I see your reasoning. But I do think with passing more also comes more incompletions just inevitably. Yeah, this one is a nine for me because I think he's going to be in mid 30s pass attempts. And so that means he's got to be like pretty much like a 75% clip as far as completion which would be like one of the highest completion percentages of all time. And so for me, yeah, I think that I'll rate that a 9 out of 10. I think that that's a, that's a tough one. I mean, I if, if he was throwing to Caleb Lohner every time, I almost guarantee you he could throw 80%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So mine is over 1.5 wide receiver touchdowns. I just, I really want to see this, especially after zero wide receiver touchdowns in the first week, you know, spreading the ball to the tight ends and the running backs. I want to see the receivers have their day. I want to see them dominate. I want to see a touchdown or uh, I want to see two touchdowns from the wide receiver group as a whole. I think they deserve it. I think they're going to get open and I think rising is going to hit them. Yeah. I mean, I want to say like, oh, two out of 10, obviously, but just knowing Utah, I've been a fan for too long to discount this one. I'm going to have to give this. Honestly, a seven, and that might seem a little bit high, but if you think about it, there's, we had zero yes, against SU. There's going to be a lot of rushing touchdowns. There's going to be the favorite red zone targets are generally tight ends or running backs. I don't know. I think it's very. I might even go up. No, I can't go an eight just for two touchdowns, but I'm going to go a seven. For me, I give this a five out of ten. Um, confident. I do. Th- I do think it's a it's a harder one. It's a little bit harder than fourteen and a half for Landon's take. Um, my reasoning for five is I do think Ludwig and Cam Rising want to give his wide receivers the ball. I think Cam really wants to feed Dorian Singer. He really wants Money Parks to be involved. Micah Pittman, Damian Alford can continue to go down that list of the guys that we'll see playing time. Um. I think Dorian Singer is going to have a day where he's going to get the ball quite often. He's going to have a great game. Um, kind of show out why he was such a highly touted transfer for Utah. Um, I would be interested to think where you think those touch- touchdowns are going to come from, Tanner. Like who in the wide receiver room are going to get those targets and going to get those touchdowns to go over one and a half touchdowns. I'm really hoping that Dorian Singer gets one. I think that he's so dynamic and so talented. We need to start. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe not force feeding him because we have so many, but definitely looking his way as like a preferred target. Yeah. For me, I think you guys are both a little bit low on the difficulty of this one, especially considering we mm-hmm. won 49 to zero and had zero wide receiver touchdowns last week. Yeah. I, I mean, do, just, I think me, we'll have an expanded suite of plays as well for wide receivers. I don't think we were trying to give anything too crazy away against SUU. And I feel like some of the more complex plays and concepts are likely wide receiver focused. And the plays that um, that we did get the ball to, for example, Singer, if you're going to leave that wide open every single time, it's going to be a very long day. So I think they're going to have to adjust, which I think will allow a guy like Dorian Singer being more of a one-on-one, leaving a safety against him without him. So giving him an opportunity to go, to get open against just a one-on-one against the a corner and the same thing with guys like money he's he's too fast and too talented as a of a route runner to be left one-on-one all game and not be open and i but i okay. do see where you're coming from though that's a it's a very valid point <laughs> yeah okay let's move on to the big 12 ratings every week we're going to do where we each rank how we view the Big 12, and then we'll go through and kind of, you know, talk about their positioning and talk about the previous game they played, you know, if they moved up or down. So let's start with Utah. Utah was, you know, we've already talked about them ad nauseum. We all rank them number one. I think that that's not really a hot take, you know, according to Vegas and anyone who sets the market, Utah's the Mm -hmm. favorite. Um, So I don't think we need to spend much time on them. Let's go over to Oklahoma State at number two. With an average rank of 4.25. What, what are you guys' thoughts on Oklahoma State and their game that they won against uh, South Dakota State? My take was that they're basically the exact same team that I thought they were, which makes sense because they're returning so much production. 
They have a great duo duo of receivers with Rashad Owens and Brennan Presley. Alan Bowman's a serviceable quarterback who gets the ball out, but sometimes can be turnover prone, not a dynamic runner. And their defense just downright kind of sucks in all just features of it. They're just not great defensively. They're exactly who I thought they were, and I think it was a good win, but I didn't really see anything that's moving the needle. I still think that the defensive side of the ball is going to hurt them a lot, and they're one-dimensional offensively. They only they averaged about, I don't know the exact number, it was either 3.3 or 3.4 yards per carry, even against South Dakota State. So their offensive 3. line... 3.3. 3.3. So their offensive line is very average, and for a team that is depending on Ollie Gordon to really run and score for them. It's either that or jump balls to Rashad Owens. And so if neither of those are working, like what happened against Texas or against UCF, they're just they just get blown out. Would you be shocked if I told you that Ollie Gordon only averaged 3.9 yards per carry? No, honestly, because that's what Not we've really. been seeing. If you watch the film against lesser teams, he runs all over them, but he completely disappears against any team that does a decent job of committing to stopping the run. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't go that far. Um, I had Oklahoma State ranked number three. Landon and Ethan had them ranked number six. Um, Oklahoma State, to me, looked pretty decent. I thought they did a, had a good game plan of getting the ball out to their weapons pretty quickly. And I think that, you know, they didn't dominate the trenches, which I think is a little concerning. But the fact that they do have those weapons on the outside that, you know, can beat inferior talent it means they're a pretty good team. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing much else to say. Okay, let's move on to Kansas. Kansas beat Lindenwood at home, 48-3. to Not really much here, I'll say. Jalen Daniels, 148 yards, one TD, one interception. Devin Neal with an incredible day, 112 yards and two touchdowns. Um, any quick thoughts on Kansas here at the number three spot? Yeah, my quick thoughts. I had them ranked relatively highly. I think I had them at three or four, I believe. I just think they look explosive and dangerous. Their receiving core is good. Devin Neal is a great running back. Jalen Daniels, when he's healthy, is one of the best quarterbacks in the entire country. And then I think they pair that with an actually pretty nice and formidable defense. So I had Kansas pretty high. Like you can see there, I had Kansas at two, um, highest rank of, of all four of us. Um, Landon really hit all the points. Devin Neal is a beast. Jaden Daniels is awesome when he's healthy. And the defense is actually a lot more impressive um, than I anticipated. Uh, again, it's against, it was Lindenwood, I believe. I can't remember exactly. So it's nothing like it was super, a super hard opponent, but the secondary is, is quite good. Okay, let's move on to talking about UCF, the number four team. Um, they beat New Hampshire 57 to 3. For me, I was the lowest on them at number eight. I had them higher preseason, but I was not a huge fan of what I saw from KJ Jefferson. I didn't think he looked very good. And while the running game is explosive, I think they're going to need the passing game to beat some of the better teams on their schedule. Agreed. The reason I still had them at three was that their defense looked much improved. Their defense was actually smothering, and I know it's New Hampshire, but that was something really nice to see from UCF. Yeah, it's RJ Harvey looked incredible. And then mm -hmm. I can't remember his name, number 22. Um, he looked incredible as well. They're very dynamic running back room. And I think KJ Jefferson, he's going to have, he's going to be better than he, he looked. First game with a new team. I think uh, Gus Menzel, he's going to be able to really tap into to the, the potential that KJ Jefferson has and really, um, bring them to a really good spot. I had them ranked five, so kind of just just one spot below where they we ended up being on our, our power ranking, or rating, I guess. Okay, let's move on to Kansas State. After kind of a slow start, they pulled away against UT Martin. Um, AJ Johnson, 153 yards, two TDs, one interception. Do you guys have any thoughts on Kansas State and their ranking number five in our power ratings? Not a ton, honestly. They're a team I'll need to see more of. So far, they're basically exactly who I thought they were. Solid running game. Avery Johnson's developing. Great runner. Still needs to work on passing. And then the defense is pretty good. Ditto. Yeah. You go, Ethan. Just ditto. Like, I mean, I agree completely with like, like everything's been said. 
they are exactly what I thought they were. They were a little bit less dominant than I originally anticipated, especially in the beginning of the game. But they they turned things around in the second half, and they look great. I... Yeah, I was the lowest on them at number nine. I just think that Avery Johnson is not going to be quite the QB everyone thinks he's going to be this year, which is totally okay. You know, I don't want to put crazy expectations on him. You know, some people were talking about Heisman. I don't think he's that level of quarterback. I think he's similar to a DTR, Dorian Thompson Robinson that, you know, needs a little bit of time to develop. Dynamic athlete, but mm-hmm. needs a little bit of time to develop. And I think their losses, especially along the offensive line and at skill positions, were enough for me to think that, you know, this is a growing year for Kansas State. I don't think it's a failure if they don't, you know, win the Big 12. I don't think it's a failure if they miss the playoff. I think that they're a good team that I'm expecting development from. Okay, let's move on to Arizona at number six. Landon, you had them ranked second. So yeah. I'll let you start on this one. So I definitely had the biggest discrepancy from you guys with them ranked second. They Truthfully, they didn't look amazing in the first week, giving up, what was it, 22 points to New Mexico State? 39. 39, yeah. See, it was not a good performance, but at the same time, I can't discount what they did last season in returning most of that production. So this is honestly kind of linked with the pick beneath it as well. I just, I need more than one week. I've got to see a little bit more. Like I could see a scenario where it's like, okay, Arizona lost their head coach. They've taken a big step back defensively, but I just need to see a little bit more. I do have to admit for me, this is probably a little bit of an overreaction having them as low as 10. Um, To kind of get some positives, Noah Fafita looked good. I mean... Tedro McMillan looked incredible. <laughs> 10 receptions, 304 yards, 4 touchdowns. My biggest concern is, outside of Tedro McMillan, who the hell does Noah Fafita have to throw the ball to? He, everybody else didn't look very impressive. The running back room did look good. I mean, Ja'Cory Kronsky Merritt, I think I'm saying his name right. 13 carries, 106 yards. That's really good. That's very impressive. Just a little bit. Can, I need to see more from them on the defensive side of the ball. Giving up 39 points to Mex- yeah. New Mexico. It's like, why are you in a dogfight with one of the worst teams in the country? Like, it just, I don't know, that's not a, a team, good look. Yeah, they literally home. may be the, they're one of the worst. Yes. Bottom 10 for sure. A team that gave up, only scored 31 points on Montana State, an FCS team last mm-hmm. last week, and they lost to an FCS. And they team lost. FCS. It's 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 it was that's that's very concerning to me. Again, probably an overreaction, very similar to Landon. If I if I was if I be thinking more logically, I need to see more than just one game. Truthfully. Yeah, and these rankings will be extremely fluid throughout the mm-hmm. year. You know, because like it's the first couple of weeks, we're getting a lot of yeah. new information. But this okay. was probably my biggest disappointing team this this week. Just, I expected them to be a lot better than they were. Okay, let's move on to Arizona State, which I think had the best win of the Big 12 week. I agree with you. 48-7 to seven over Wyoming when they were only favored by like six and a half. Wyoming they is absolutely good. They beat Texas Tech them. last year. Yeah, they absolutely destroyed them, and it did not look close. For me, I was already higher than consensus on ASU simply because I really like their coach, and I think they have more talent than people give them credit for. And this just further solidified that. I was the highest ranked at five, and I think that, you know, this is a team that people cannot sleep on anymore. They have talent, they have good coaching, and they have a quarterback. So they've got got a lot of ingredients Mm -hmm. to me. For me, this was the pick that I felt very worst at, power rating. I didn't want to put them at 10. My heart is saying that they're higher than that just because they have one of the most talented rosters in the Big 12. I love Dillingham as a head coach. And, like, it makes sense, like, oh, they're ahead of schedule on this rebuild. Like, we knew it was going to take a couple years. I just, I need to see another week. I need to see another week. I'm thinking too much of that Arizona State team that played Utah and lost 55-3. to And they did have some injuries as well, but... I just need one more week, a couple more weeks, and I can start putting Arizona in that top 10. Yeah, this Mississippi game, State game next week will be really key Mm -hmm. to, like, understanding what ASU is. I think ASU's defense looked way better than they did last year. Yes. 
Um, I had them at eight, so kind of right where they are for us. Um, they're tied for seventh in their in our in our rating. Um, I think they're they looked they were very impressive. The offense looked great. The defense looked excellent. Um, but kind of piggybacking off what Laden said, another week would definitely be beneficial to see where they they truly are. Okay. I will start us off on the back end of the top half of the ratings, which was Colorado, tied for seventh with Arizona State. For me, I was the highest on Colorado. I put them number two. I know that a lot of people will not agree with that, but I think North Dakota State is probably the best FCS team. And I feel like I saw enough improvement from Colorado in other areas that I think their raw talent is going to win out. North Dakota State only was able to rush for 3.7 yards per carry. I thought Colorado's defensive line did an excellent job. And when they have who I think is maybe the two best players in the Big 12 and Shadur Sanders and Travis Hunter um, uh, combined with you know, a really good transfer class. I think that Colorado is a team that, you know, people love to clown on them, but I think they're actually really good this year. Yeah, I agree with a lot of the points you made. I'm definitely higher on Colorado than most. I just, I saw a lot of the same team as last year. And granted, that team last year did struggle with injuries as well, and they went 4-8. and eight. I do think that they're going to be at the minimum bowl eligible this year. Just that, less injuries, plus a step down in competition. And I think their ceiling could be as high as two. I just want to see more specifically from their offensive line. Because what happens when they go into some of these Big 12 teams that are going to want to ball control them and establish the run? I just but don't like, who know. is that team? Who is that it, team? Like besides half Utah? the teams in the Big 12. Like Iowa, Oklahoma State will want to do that. Kansas will want to do it. Kansas State. I don't think any of those teams do that. I think most of them are running back focused. No, they're all like Devin Neal, RJ like especially... Harvey. Ollie I Gordon. I, I just I just disagree. They're mainly a run like Iowa State as well. West Virginia had the number three rushing offense in the country. West Virginia, I agree with. I just think there's teams that we'll have to see if that's successful or not against them because it was working yeah. last year. For me, I actually think Colorado style fits perfectly because, like, I feel like the majority of Big Twelve teams want to, you know, up tempo, throw the ball, and they don't really have great defenses. I think that Colorado can get in a lot of shootouts. And when Colorado's in a shootout, I'm always just going to go with Shadur Sanders and Travis Hunter because they're so dynamic. My takeaway, okay. I, have them at, I had them at nine. Um, with Colorado, my only concern is can they continue to have those big play potential? Two out of their four touchdowns were from a 41-yard pass to, from Shudder to Travis Hunter, a 69-yard passing touchdown to Jimmy Horn Jr., and then their third touchdown in the third quarter was set up from a 41-yard pass from Shudder to Jimmy Horn Jr. So it's one of those things where can the offense continue to have the big plays that they, they need, and can the defense um, hold teams? That's where I'm a little concerned about. I had them at nine kind of right where there are for our mm -hmm. rating pretty yeah pretty decent spot as far as the big plays like yeah like that's probably the thing i'm most confident in colorado yeah agree. like that's the thing that i that i think will always be there i do think that they'll just outscore some big 12 teams as well where it's just like oh man this is a huge mismatch with shadur and travis hunter yeah it's can that keep up that's like the biggest thing especially against the better teams in the, in yeah. the big 12. and another factor i didn't touch on is if one of them gets injured, it starts falling apart a little bit. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, move let's move on to the back half of the power rating. Uh, tied for ninth are Baylor and Iowa State. Let's start with Baylor. Ethan, you had the highest ranking on Baylor at seven. Um, maybe just quickly on this one because we've talked about Baylor. Yeah. I just liked what I saw on offense. They were a little bit more improved. And then defensive side of the ball, like we talked about, the front seven was a lot. It looks a lot more improved than it did last year. I had them a little bit higher. They impressed me a little bit more than other teams did. Okay. Uh, talk about Iowa State as well, Ethan. You had them ranked number three, yeah. which was a huge discrepancy from Connor's. Rocco Beck, believer. Yeah, I do. I, I truly do. I really like Rocco Beck this year. Um, I just like him in general. He, for me, this was one of the games I really kept an eye on. I watched the whole game here. It's probably more of like other teams disappointed me than Iowa State impressing mm -hmm. 
um they they just they did exactly what i expected them to do and they did it really really well i liked how um how they looked on the offensive side um which is noel jalen noel looked awesome eight receptions 135 yards they just they impressed me and a lot of other teams disappointed me and i bumped them up high in my rating Okay, um, let's move on to talk about TCU. I had the highest ranking at them with number six. Um, I watched their entire game versus Stanford, and I honestly was pretty impressed. Most of their errors were you know, penalties or sloppy play, things that I think are mostly based on luck and that I think can be cleaned up. You know, TCU had a fumble on the goal line. You know, they had a couple of other fumbles throughout the game. They had penalties in bad spots that allowed Stanford to you know, sustained drives that they otherwise would have had to punt. And so I think that, you know, if you play this game out 10 times, this is probably one of the closer simulations to me. Um, I think that, you know, a little cleaner play and they probably blow this game open. I think TCU has talent. I do trust their coaching to clean it up. And I really actually liked what I saw from TCU aside from all the, you know, bonehead plays. Yeah, I think they played pretty well also. Josh Hoover had a good game. His receivers really did not do him any favors. They honestly had a pretty no, tons bad of game. Drops. Tons of drops. And that is something where, like, if your receivers are not going to be great, I keep them down a little bit, but they're a team that I'd be looking for to move up if they get some good wins. Okay, let's move on to West Virginia. We all had them ranked That's exactly so weird. at number 12, which is... a. Uh, funny but um i mean i think the game versus penn state was pretty discouraging you know they kind of just got bullied they were not able mm -hmm. to throw the ball they were not able to run the ball they really weren't able to do pretty much anything you know they were thoroughly outplayed by penn state in every kind of facet of the game garrett Green I do think that penn good state is elite. yeah he was pretty bad i do think penn state is an elite team it's like i don't judge them that harshly for doing it but like they did not seem on the same in the same neighborhood as penn state really yeah, exactly. Penn State is not really a team that's designed to like run up the score on you a ton. They just kind of got dominated. It was never that close, and it just felt like they kind of got outplayed throughout the entire game. But at the same time, that's pro that's the best team they'll play this year. So you can't drop them too far. Yep. If West Virginia can't run, they're not going to do much, and they only hit 85 rushing guards against mm -hmm. Penn State. If they if that is something that continues, they're going to have a rough season. I don't think that's the case. I think they'll have their team that tr is trending upwards, especially like Landon said, Penn State's definitely the hardest team to play this year. Yeah, I think that people are a little overly optimistic. They had an easy schedule last year. And then Garrett Green, he's a good runner, but he can't really pass. And when your team is that one-dimensional, as soon as the run is stopped, everything falls apart. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Let's quickly go over BYU. This was a pretty uneventful game, I would say. Um, you know, not really a dominant victory, but not really like that close of a game mm -hmm. either. It was kind of just like mid in every direction, I would say. Um, I don't really have any thoughts about BYU, just the fact that they're pretty much who I thought they were. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I will say that they have Retzlaff starting, which I wouldn't feel great about as a BYU fan. He was the lowest QBR of all QBs that played last year, Power 5. So hopefully he's made some improvement, but you never know how much someone can change over one off season. I will say Bretzoff impressed me more than I thought he was going to. He didn't look as terrible as I did. I mean, three touchdowns, zero interceptions. That's all you can ask for against um, a team. P4 opponent playing in FCS. They took care of business, but it wasn't super impressive. Okay, let's move on to Cincinnati. Cincinnati actually did struggle quite a bit with mm -hmm. Towson. Um, kind of a sloppy game. Their quarterback, 383 yards, two touchdowns. I don't really have a lot of thoughts on this game. It's, you know, they're ranked in the bottom three for a reason, and I don't think they're that good this year. Agreed. Not a ton of thoughts for me either. It just, I'll be honest, I didn't watch this game. They're going to need to get some wins before I'm tuning into Cincinnati football, truth be told. But judging from the score, it, just, it looked like they never... They didn't win as convincingly as you would hope. Yeah, same same exact thoughts. I didn't watch this game. Didn't really have any desire to. Kind of a box score looking at it. And this didn't really do anything impressive for me. Yeah. Even though Houston got blown out, I 
heavily considered putting Texas Tech at number 16. Me too. Because, you know, going to overtime with Abilene Christian, giving up 51 points yield to a like a pretty bad FCS team, like that is embarrassing. I think Texas Tech has the worst defense in the Big 12 this year, and I don't really think it's that close. Their offense looks decent, but, you know, if you can't pull away from an FCS team at home and you go to OT, like, you are not one of the top teams in a Power 4 conference. You just aren't. I agree with you. Like, 51 points to an FCS team, you're going into the unfixable defense category. Like, you just don't have the players. Giving up 506 passing yards. Yeah, that's that's honestly, like, one of the craziest things I've ever seen. 500 Holy. yards. Like, even Five. giving up 300 yards to an FCS team, like, total yards is, like, crazy. But 500 yards passing, 506 yards, they, they had um so many freaking yards. Let me see exactly they, how many they had. They gave up oh, 615 yards total. Yeah, wow. I mean, dude, that is unbelievable. I don't care if Pat Mahomes comes back. Your team might not be bowl eligible. Yeah, exactly. Like, he's it's, gonna have to yeah. score fifty-five a game. Exactly. Yeah, this Texas Tech is a bottom feeder this year in the Big Twelve. I, there's really not a lot of hope. But... I'm curious, Landon. Obviously, thirteen is in a high ranking, but why do you had? Why did you have them at thirteen over someone like BYU and Cincinnati? Just more talent. Just more talent on the roster was the only factor, really. Just generally, when a team has more talent like that, they're gonna be their ceilings just higher. So I just had them above some different teams. All right. Okay, let's talk about Houston. Houston lost 27 to 7 at home to UNLV. I don't think it's as, as bad as the loss as it looks on the surface because UNLV is one of the top contenders in the Mountain West this year. But I mean, it's not good when you're getting just completely dominated, which is why they're at 16. Yeah, I think you hit hit it hit the hammer right on the nail. No, hit the nail right on the hammer. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I, my brain's all confused now. Holy crap. You made a great point. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, not a ton of thoughts about this Houston UNLV game. I'm not going to be diving deep into the numbers, but they didn't look great. They lost. You shouldn't be losing to teams that aren't Power 5. I will say I was very disappointed in Donovan Smith. Houston's my next team. I lived a few years in Houston. It's it's a fun school. I love their jerseys. I wish Donovan Smith had a better game, but throwing two interceptions against uh unlv is quite disappointing yeah i i do wish that houston could you know pull something out because they are in a prime city like it'd be better for the big 12 if they were good so like mm -hmm. i do hope that they can figure something out okay well that is it for our big 12 review please leave a comment you know if we're totally underrating or disrespecting your team or if we're overrating them um, let us know what you think about your team. We always love to, you know, interact with your comments and see what you guys think. Okay, so, let's move on to a fun little game that we're going to play. Yeah, to finish off today's uh, podcast or video, I kind of built, I saw something on Twitter where it's an Oklahoma State fan. He built a grid just like this, where it's like build your your dream Oklahoma State team. And for me, I was thinking like, oh, this would be really fun to do with the Pac-12 era. Like obviously with the Pac-12 being gone, and Utah joining in the Big 12. There's a lot of awesome players that played for Utah during that that stretch of from 2011 to 2020 to 2023, where Utah was in the Pac-12, that 12-year stretch. Um, I kind of wanted to build this little thing. As you see on the top right corner, Sione Vaki. Last year, he played offense, defense. We wanted to make, do something a little special where he's a $7. You don't have to take a running back if you pick him, and you don't have to take a defensive player if you pick him. You, he's, he's both of them. Um, but I would love to see your guys' thoughts and what that team you would build with your $15. Yeah, I was already looking at it a little bit. I can go first if you guys are still thinking. Yeah, go for it. So I would go $5 for rising. Quarterback is the most important position. you got to spend $5 there. And then I would actually jump right to Vaki, where I would take him for 7 taking it to $12. So that's quarterback, running back, and defensive player. And so now I have three bucks for tight end and wide receiver. I would take the Yasmanian Devil for $2 and then end with Samson Nakua. Not the ideal choice for wide receiver. He'll only play for a couple of years before transferring to your rival. But <laughs> it's what I had to do to get this team. So that is Rising, Vaki, Samson Nakua, and Yasmin. 
that is the team. I love it. Yeah, that's a great team. That's something that I would definitely consider picking as well. Okay, Ethan, are you ready to go? I'm still thinking. I can. I got it. I can. I'm. I'm gonna do a little bit different. I think Cam is the obvious pick, but just kind of keep it. Um, fun. He wants Bryson Tyler. Barnes. I'm gonna take Tyler Huntley as my four. Um, probably led some of the some of the best Utah teams that didn't win a Pac-12 championship in 2019 as our starting quarterback for four dollars. And then I gotta take Devonte Booker. Devonte Booker oh, with Booker Tyler Huntley would be so much fun. So that's eight bucks there. Um, I'm going to skip wide receiver right now because I'm going to go to tight end and I'm going to take um, Brant Keithy. Ooh. Brant Keithy, Tyler Huntley, back at it again when Brother Keithy was a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, absolutely love that. So for that's $13. I only yeah, have dude. two positions left. Yeah, so there's only, you and have Nakua. to go Broughton Nakua, bro. I like Broughton was probably my one of my least favorite players back in the <laughs> for Utah the few years. But... <laughs> This Keithy Covey, Keithy and uh, Huntley, I had to have it, and Booker is just probably my favorite running back in Utah history. That is a super balanced attack, which I like. Okay. And had a lot to desire. <laughs> I've, I've got mine planned out now. I like mm. my team. Okay, I'm starting with Travis Wilson. I think Ooh. he's pretty underrated as Utah quarterback, and getting him for $3, I feel like that saves me some for other places. I think he's serviceable. Um, And then I'm going to go with Tavion Thomas, also $3 mm. at back um he is the all-time leader in utah rushing touchdowns for one season and i think that at his peak which is what i'm assuming i'm getting yeah. he was pretty freaking unstoppable and so i think for three dollars that's also a good pick um also get wider, baby mamas yeah <laughs> wide receiver is where i make you know kind of my first big pick i'm going to take trez anderson for five dollars mm. i think that um his connection with Travis Wilson was so good, and I want to bring that back. He was our last thousand yard receiver for Utah, and so I think I'm getting a really dangerous combo with those three it's already proven players. to work. Exactly, already proven to work, and so that's eleven dollars. And so I have four dollars. I have four dollars left. I'm right. That's yeah, six and then five. So that's yes. Okay, yeah. So I have four dollars left. I am gonna go Yasmin for two dollars. And then Marquise Blair for $2 as well. And so I think that, you know, maybe I didn't splurge as much on the tight end as I could have, but I think I can make up for that with Tavion Thomas Mm -hmm. and Drez Anderson. Mm -hmm. And then Marquise Blair, I think, was, you know, playmaker. So I'll play an aggressive style of defense, you Mm -hmm. know, with him as my leader. I like that team a lot, dude. Yasmin is low-key, like, the value pick of this whole thing, I feel like. Yeah, he's got some upside for a $2. Like, he has some upside. Like, he was a good blocker, too, and he was yeah. good at catching. So, like, he, he's pretty, like, versatile, I would say. To kind of go over just Marquise the Blair real quick. Too. Sorry to cut you off. Marquise Blair, oh, too, good? is a great pick as well. Mm-hmm. I agree. To kind of just go over, I'm just going to go over the position, like, each, and kind of go from right to left, from $5 to $1, kind of go over each person just quickly. Just $5, Cam Rising, Tyler Huntley, Travis Wilson, Jordan Wynn, one of the first quarterbacks for Utah in the Pac-12. Bryson Barnes, then you got Zach Moss, Devontae Booker, Tavion Thomas, TJ Pledger, and DeQuinton Jackson. DeQuinton Jackson was there at the one just because he transitioned to that running back role. He was great when he was healthy, but he just we needed someone there, and he fit the mold. Drez Anderson, number five. Darian Carrington, one year for Utah, but he had like 960-something 60 something yards for that single season. He came to a Utah team that desperately needed wide receiver help, and he really helped us out there. Obviously, Britton Covey. Britton Covey at three is, is an interesting one. Obviously, he's like the definition of a Utah man. Um, a lot of people say, Why isn't he your five? His production at the wide receiver position wasn't as good as Carrington or Anderson. If we had him as a, as a utility player, as you get the punt return, you get the kick return. He's probably a five or a four, but just for the wide receiver production, he would be your wide receiver one. He's at that three. We know Devon Bailey. We know uh, Samson Nakua. He's a one because he went to BYU. Um, Brant Keithy, Don Kincaid, Cole Father and Cam Thomas Yasmin and Mika Sugaturaga. We all know them. Tight end really popped off these last like five years. 
And then your defensive player, Nate Orchard, he had a season where he had 18 and a half sacks in one season in college. Insane. Yeah, that's crazy. The, he had to be my five. <laughs> he had to be the five there. Devin Lloyd, obviously the leader of the defense of the back of the first ever Pac-12 um, championship for Utah. He had to put him there. Jonah Ellis had a great year last year, jumped in the NFL. He'd probably be higher if he stayed another year or two. Um, Marquis Blair, he didn't have a lot of time at Utah, but what, when, he, what he, when he was here, he was productive, and the dude could freaking hit. And then we all know Broughton. Again, he was, he was on those, um, those Pac-12 championship teams, but he just, he just wasn't that number one corner that continued. He, 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 he left a lot to be desired, in my opinion. So I put him at the one there. And then we all know Sione Vak. You talked about him in the beginning. Okay. Thank you guys very much for listening to the episode. We think we're on the verge of a really special Utah season. So make sure you're subscribed to get all the content um, here. We'll be previewing games every single week. We'll be doing fun activities like this. You know, let us know what team you would build with $15. And so please like, comment, and subscribe. And go Utes!